Bulovinaka, good evening and namaste. You are on Fiji Village Street Talk. I am Vijay Narayan. Tonight, in studio, another leader who is vying for seats in the 2022 general elections. We just weeks away, less than a month away. A uh, big day today where the candidate's ball draw was done. Uh, a lot of people were asking, what does that entail? Mm -hmm. Well, it is part of the Electoral Act. And the Electoral Act states uh, that candidates they need to have unique numbers. You will only see numbers when you go to the ballot box. The ballot paper only has numbers for you, so you have to ensure that you find out your candidate's unique number. Uh, that will be promoted uh, quite heavily by all candidates, no doubt about that. And then you have to either circle, tick or cross over that number. So the candidate's ball draw, according to the Electoral Act, is the name is called out of the candidate, the draw of the tennis balls with numbers on them, taken out today, called out uh, uh, while being observed by the political party representatives, the multinational observer groups, according to law that was done. After that was done, the postal ballots have started uh, printing as of today, and the ballot pa papers will print out based on the numbers uh, that have been allocated now. So uh, that process has no now gone to the next place. Uh, we've got uh, the National Federation Party leader, Professor Biman Prasad, in studio tonight. Professor Prasad, first of all, thank you for accepting our invitation on behalf of our listeners and our viewers. Good evening, Vijay, and thank you for the invitation, and good evening to our listeners. Professor Prasad, 2014 general elections, you were the leader, NFP got 5.45% of the votes. That equates to 27,066 votes. 2018 general elections, the party got 7.38% of the votes, equates to 33,515 votes. Both elections, you finished off with three seats in parliament. How are things looking for the NFP this year? Can you win more than three seats? Well, Vijay, the first point is that the people have uh, uh, looked at our performance, uh, even with three seats from 2014 until 2018. And then uh, we obviously increased our votes in 2018. We almost uh, had four seats, but we lost one as a result of the Dijon calculation. And we believe that the people of Fiji have seen our performance, they have seen what we have put before Parliament, they have understood the policies that we have articulated in and outside of Parliament, and the people of Fiji have seen the record of this government, not only as an elected government from 2014, but also uh, the leadership of Frank Baini Marama and Aya Sayed Kuyum from 2006 school. So 15 years and we believe and this is what we're getting from the ground that the people have seen the performance of that leadership. They are ready for a change. We're getting that feeling and we're more than confident and more than optimistic that this time the National Federation Party uh, will do extremely well and we are already looking at being in government with our partners, the People's Alliance Party. Thank you, Professor Prasad, and we will definitely talk about your partnership with People's Alliance. People can uh, contact us on 3314-766 or 7730-766 uh, with your questions. You can also post your questions with the hashtag Fiji Village Street Talk. There's a question from uh, Ronald Pratap. This question is not just about, according to him, this is, I'm quoting him, mm -hmm. this question is not just about his own, but from many NFP supporters in Fiji. Mm -hmm. Many in Fiji were confident that NFP will rise and win this election, without any doubt, till the party merger with the People's Alliance, in particular Mr. Ramboka, as what happened back in 1987 onwards, is still hurting people. How, he says, Many are in a dilemma. They are fearful. And they are asking you, Mr. Prasad, what can you assure the supporters that this will not be repeated? A very good question, uh, Vijay, and I thank uh, Pratav for that question. Two things. Uh, one, uh, this is not a measure. In fact, under the current constitution of the Electoral Act, 
you cannot have a pre-election coalition. You 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 cannot have a you call you cannot call it a major just like that. So let me just clear this uh, very um, well. The partnership agreement with the People's Alliance Party is a post-election agreement. So what that means is that before the election, the NFP is going to fight on its own. The People's Alliance is going to fight on its own. And after the election, whatever the seats that the National Federation Party wins and the People's Alliance and the combination of those uh, seats for each party will be the government. And uh, let me uh, come back to Mr. Rambuka. Yes, Mr. Rambuka did the coup in 87. We were, I was personally at the forefront uh, in opposing the coup. He uh, ran the military government for um, uh, seven or eight months until from May to December. Then the power was handed over to an interim government which ran the country for five years. Then a constitution was imposed by that interim uh, administration uh, called the 1990 Constitution, under which the 1992 election held. And there were two elections, 92, and the government was defeated with the help of the National Federation Party and the Labour Party. And Mr. Rambuka came back with a bigger majority. The NFP came with a bigger majority in 1994. And from 1994, Jairam Reddy, the then leader of the National Federation Party, worked with Mr. Rambuka to change that constitution. And it resulted in a bipartisan uh, work and it resulted in the 1990 world acclaimed 1997 constitution under which uh, the 1999 election was held. So uh, unlike Mr. Rambuka, and he ran a good government from 1992 to 1997, of course he lost, Jeremy Reddy lost, NFP lost and they accepted the defeat. Mr. Baini Marama did the coup in 2006. He ran a military government until 2013 and then imposed a constitution, the 2013 constitution, under which we had the 2014 election. So uh, Mr. Rambuka has a record. The National Federation Party worked with him. Uh, we, ha we saw him in government and Jairam Reddy trusted Mr. Rambuka. In fact, it was Mr. Rambuka who invited Jairam Reddy to the Great Council of Chiefs, first ever in the history of this country, where an Indo-Fijian leader was invited to address the GCC to get the 1997 constitution passed. And so we have a record of, of working with him, and we believe that the 1997 constitution was a major transformation of Mr. Rambuka with Mr. Jairam Reddy. And, and so what will happen after this election? And this is what people need to understand. We are fighting the election on our own. We will have different uh, plans and vision. Uh, Mr. Rambuka's party will have its own manifesto, vision or plans. They will go for every vote in this country. We will go for every vote in this country. But after the election, the partnership agreement that we have signed and we've made it public, we are not hiding it from the people. We are saying very clearly that after the election, the people can expect us to work together to create an inclusive government. So that's how transparent, open and accountable we are in terms of why we have gone with Mr. Rambuka and why we believe that the National Federation Party, and in fact, uh, contrary to the popular you know, um, uh, opinion by some of our critics, in fact, after we signed the partnership agreement, after we had this joint tours, there is a lot of excitement. The people can, for the first time in 15 years and in the last eight years, see a very clear choice. They can see a government between the National Federation Party and the People's Alliance Party. And, and that's what is exciting the people and our support is growing. And those uh, small category of people who remember Mr. Rambuka from 87, I don't blame them. I think that's quite natural for people to have some doubts uh, about, you know, what happened then. But more and more, Vijay, I can tell you uh, as I go around the country, and as you can see, uh, you know, Mr. Rambuka has some very prominent, you know, Indo-Fijian candidates, you know, they are able to attract people. And the joint uh, visits that we had, we attracted 
all kinds of people who are coming out and giving support to this, this partnership because they can see a government. They actually think, they can see that there will be a new government, an inclusive government, different from what they've seen. Can you confirm who will be the Prime Minister in well, the People's we, Alliance and NFP arrangement? I have said very clearly, you know, that's a very pragmatic, uh, you know, uh, announcement by me that Mr. Rambuka will be the Prime Minister. And what will you be? Well, uh, as I said, we have a partnership. I trust Mr. Rambuka, he trusts me. I'm not worried about uh, where we will be, but... We obviously have an understanding of how the government will be structured, what will be the architecture, and that's something that we will uh, reveal to the people when we come to it. Will you be the deputy PM? Is that the arrangement? Well, as I said, you know, we will, we will reveal the... When will the, that be revealed? Uh, that will be after the election. Because one thing I've said very clearly, and, and people must understand that I am right now trying to win as many seats as possible for NFP. And Mr. Rambuka is trying to win as many seats as possible for the People's Alliance Party. Because under this system, this is not a coalition before the election. So there will be, there will, there, there is going to be competition. There is going to be a difference in policies. As you see coalitions in any other country, for example, in New Zealand, if you look at the Greens and the Labour Party, the Greens would have very different policies before the election. But when they come into government, you know, there is, this Compromise. is how coal, coalition governments work. I mean, you know, there will be issues, but we trust each other. We have worked together uh, before. So the trust uh, is that Mr. Rambuka will be prime minister and uh, structure is agreed to, but will be revealed later. We, we, we know what, how we will run the government, uh, what will be the basis of the partnership, what will be the basis of... Uh, uh, forming that government and that's uh, something that I accept, the party accept. I'm confident that that's going to be the best deal for the people of this country. Questions have been sent where people are saying that in your videos uh, back in 2014 you made it clear that you would not support mm. people who execute a coup. Mm. They are asking why you have changed and now decided to support Mr. Rambuka. I think the context in which Vijay uh, that was said uh, was very clear. I said at that time the choice was you had uh, Frank Baini Marama who was a coup leader. Uh, Rambuka was not in the election. Uh, but as I explained to you earlier, Rambuka's history is now different than what uh, Frank Baini Marama's history is. And the NFP at this point in time found it comfortable. I worked with him in parliament uh, when he was the leader of the opposition. And so we, we built that partnership. So it, it is not consist inconsistent uh, in terms of what the NFP stand was. We've never supported a coup. I have never supported a coup. Our position remains very, very clear and consistent that we will never support a coup. We've never supported a coup before. But... That was the context in which uh, that was said. And, you know, BJ, you know, uh, it, it's very pragmatic, um, you know, thing to do that, you know, when you have a particular circumstances at a particular point in time, you know, politicians take a stance. And that stance, I mean, Jeram Reddy, who would have believed that Jeram Reddy would have worked with Rambuka uh, and got the 1997 constitution? He uh, was totally opposed to Mr. Rambuka in the 1992 election. And it was Mr. Chaudhary who actually gave support to Mr. Rambuka because he didn't have the outward majority in 1992 within uh, the SB2 to form the government. So there was an agreement uh, where the Labour Party uh, lent its support with seven seats for him to become Prime Minister. And, and, and those decisions are made by political leaders. And, and that statement that I made in 2014, I don't deny that. But it was made in the context of what we had at that point in time. And you can't work with Mr. Baini Marama? No, he, I mean, in fact, in the last election, Vijay, you'd remember, when I said we had our options open, we said we will decide after the election. And what did Ayaz Sayed Kayum say and Frank Bain? Oh, we will never form a government with any other political party. So they've made the position very clear. And, and so this time... I am making my position very clear that what Baini Marama and Sayed Kayum have done to this country in terms of economic management and all the other, I will never join them in government. NFP will never join them in government. We'll go into uh, other people's alliance issues or questions sure. are there. 
Uh, I know this matter is before the court. Sure. I want to know how you've been holding up, what, how, how, how things are going. You got tangled up with issues uh, with a former candidate, Mr. Mm -hmm. Taniguchi, allegations made against you, uh, texting his wife, other things, mm -hmm. uh, allegations of giving a kiss on the cheek, uh, and then being charged, then uh, no charge after the DPP stated there is insufficient evidence. What do you have mm -hmm. to say to the people about this? Because this is also being played out publicly. Well, um, let me first of all say that um, it was a big stitch up by those who wanted to be malicious and bring uh, disrepute uh, to me. Um, and I'm happy that um, uh, that uh, episode in terms of the charge is, is behind me um, or behind us. Um, but let me also say that before the police, uh, before I was taken in by the police, I had already filed a defamation suit against the Fiji Broadcasting Commission, uh, FBC, and Mr. Taniguchi. And that matter, uh, Vijay uh, is uh, in the court and is sub judice, so I am not uh, going to say anything more. But let me tell you this um, I was never unfazed by uh, this. My wife is a very strong um, woman, smart woman. She understands that with politics, uh, these things will be thrown at you, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, she herself was a subject of attack by the Prime Minister some time back, uh, as you know. Um, so um, she has stood firm, the family has stood uh, firm, but more importantly, Everyone in my party, my friends, uh, and, and uh, every uh, man and women who understood the circumstances um, has thrown their support uh, for me. And I am really grateful and uh, I am focused. Uh, I was always focused. I am still focused on winning the election and forming the next government. You're watching Fiji Village Straight Talk. I'm VJ Narayan. We'll be back after this break. What I did in 2006 is to clean up the mess that we started. When there had been Itoke leadership, everybody had been embraced. He cannot stomach the fact that he's not in government. You said that you couldn't pay our bonuses, but this shows an increase in board directors' fees. For any you, person, you are wanting to lead the country, not me. For any, I'm asking you the question again, back to corporal punishment. Right. What's your stand on it? Fiji First Bye. cannot intervene into a personal Absolutely matter. Absolutely you can for small you businesses. Can't. I was very uh, surprised when you came out with that statement that I would conduct a coup if I lose. Not Hand me. on your heart. It's him. No, you're a uh, joke. Uh, no, yes. you are a joke. You're a joke. You're a joke. You don't bring it up. We don't no, no, I'm going to bring it up. You were a commander. But yes, Every but military officer and serviceman at the time was under your command. You've forgotten you trade them. Bulubinaka, this is Fiji Village Street Talk. I'm VJ Narai. Fiji Village Straight Talk with VJ Narayan, sponsored by Salt and Pepper Home Decor, living in high quality. Watch it live on the Fiji Village Facebook page. Welcome back. This is Fiji Village Street Talk. I am Vijay Narayan. Our guest tonight is the leader of the National Federation Party, Professor Biman Prasad. Professor Prasad, let's talk about what people are expecting sure. from your party. Cost of living is a major concern for many. People are concerned about increasing food prices. Mm -hmm. It is getting harder to put food on the table. What is your plan? That is exactly uh, correct, Vijay, and, and that's a very good question. And I can feel the pain and suffering of people, especially those in the lower income ranks. But before I uh, tell you exactly what we, four things that we would uh, do when we get into government, let me uh, say this. This issue of the rising cost of living is not a recent phenomenon. You remember, or do you recall in 2014, when NFP put out a manifesto and a very clear policy that when we come into government, we would reduce the VAT 
from 15% to 10%, it was very high. And what, what did Fiji Fest do? They went on a rampage throughout the country saying, oh, this is going to be a big hole in the budget. Where is Biman Prasad going to get the money? And lo and behold, when they came into government, they themselves reduced the VAT from 15 to 9%. They didn't go to 10% because Biman Prasad said 10%, so they had to go down 1% more. And then they, they forgot, they forgot that when, you, when you're dealing with rising cost of living, you know, inflation, you don't just look at reducing the, the prices. I mean, it is not always possible to reduce the prices at up to a level where uh, it will be comfortable for the people. They forgot about that. So when in 2018 we found out, we actually understood that the cost of living was still rising. So we proposed two policies in 2018, Vijay, and we put that policy out 18 months before the election, almost 18 months before the election. We said that we, should, we will work towards, in a phased manner, for a minimum living wage of $5 an hour. And we also said that we will reduce VET to zero, and we gave 23 items, including basic medicine. Then again, they went on a rampage. They, 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 they created fear. They said there will be a big hole where is the money going to come from? And they forgot about the people. Now, two years later, when the COVID pandemic hit us, even before COVID pandemic hit us, there was this rallying cry from the people that the cost of living, rising food prices, poverty level was increasing. Then they did the same thing. Then they started talking about raising the minimum wage. And we still haven't got to $4. They are now promising that when they come into government, then... From January, it will be $4, that's what they've said. And then the things that they ridiculed the NFP for, they copied the same list. They, In fact, they didn't change even the order of the list of things that we put in to give people the relief. But what has happened since then is that because of COVID, the freight cost has just gone up. So what we will, what we will do, there are four things we will do. First of all, we are going to review the structure of this price control, we will look at what the Commerce Commission is doing and how we can uh, pinpoint, you know, the flash points, the critical points where we can intervene. The second thing is, you know, the, the duty, the fiscal duty is charged CIF, cost, insurance and freight. And what has happened in the last uh, two years and after COVID, uh, because of the shipping uh, issues, the freight cost has gone up, and in fact, it's gone up by almost three times. And some of the physical duties are there. It has remained there. And so that has, and people are finding it very, very difficult. The other thing that this government did uh, was during COVID, when the fuel price went, went down for a while, they put another 20 cents tax on fuel. So in fact, uh, on a, on a litre of, of fuel, people were paying 66 cents tax to government. That was then reduced after we raised it in Parliament uh, by 20 cents. It still remains 44 cents. So those are things that we would look at. The third thing we would look at is trade policy reform. How we can look at the import of goods and services into the country, particularly basic uh, goods and where we are uh, getting it. The fourth thing that we're going to look at, uh, Vijay, is the supply chain. Uh, it's not just uh, Fiji, it's, it's uh, shipping uh, the supply chain uh, logistics in the Pacific and how goods are coming into the Pacific, including Fiji, and what are the uh, costs that's being added. So these are four areas that we would immediately uh, look at, review, and work out how we can give relief to the people. At the same time, our focus will be on raising uh, people's income, whether it be in agriculture, whether it be uh, you know, uh, for workers, uh, whether it be uh, these things. Would be, and in fact, one of the things we will do, and let me just reveal this, as soon as we get into government, the, the NFP and the People's Alliance, we will have a workers, government 
an employer summit because this under this government unions uh, have been rendered powerless and there are a lot of studies around the world including the IMF study which says that where unions have become weak where employees have been casualized on temporary contracts including civil servants the negotiating power of the workers in the unions with the employers is weakened and there is no uh, urge to to look at how we can improve income levels so our approach will be two planned looking at the income side as well as looking at how we can control the price how we can reduce the price where it's not possible to reduce prices it is possible to raise income we will consider that minimum wage you'll be putting that up we talked about minimum wage i mean this government uh, basically you know copied our policy they listened to us in fact over the last 8 years vijay they ha they have reluctantly uh, uh, took on board a lot of nfp policies without uh, acknowledging it uh, and we we were happy that they were actually looking at the the minimum wage but minimum wage just a nominal minimum wage uh, sometimes doesn't make sense it's a living wage that we need to look at because the living wage is what determines whether people remain in poverty or not so uh, i'm i'm sure we'll talk about poverty uh, just go there yeah. because yeah. Uh, according But, to the household and income expenditure yeah. survey of 2019 2020 this is before covid 19 mm. mm. uh, the the basic needs poverty line uh, stood at $41.91 mm. per adult equivalent per week mm. uh, definitely people cannot survive on that uh what is your living wage that you're looking at knowing that this was before uh, covid-19 what's your assessment of those living on or below the poverty line mm. and what are you looking at in providing uh, in in fact you know it it's a, it's, a, it's a national shame uh, that we 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 are relying on on the poverty line uh, of of that amount but let me just just tell you a um, uh, few few more facts uh before covid-19 uh, in fact in 2019 our economy had contracted this is a government which went on a spending spree before uh, 2018 election so when we came into 2018 we had negative growth the real wages had not risen uh, the cost of living was was still going up and so when the report came out uh, the poverty rate was Uh, 29% and of, of course you know the uh, ceo of the independent bureau of statistics and, and this is another point vijay bureau of statistics uh, fiji bureau of statistics i i uh, done a lot of work with them when i was a professor at the university and 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 other national statistical offices in the, in the region as well fiji bureau of statistics was one of the most efficient uh, in in fact well uh, equipped uh national statistical offices independent office to produce the statistics and so when the report came out it was a very clear uh, indication that um the the poverty rate had not gone down it had it had gone uh, up and in fact in that report it also said very clearly that 15 to 20% of the people were on the margins of the poverty in other words they could they could fall into poverty very quickly and so when the covid pandemic hit us my estimate is that all those people between 15 to 20% actually went into poverty so during covid we were looking at a poverty rate of almost 50% this is what i said in parliament now i'm not sure how many people have been, have have uh, been able to come out of that uh, and uh, what is the situation now because nothing that comes out uh, from this government now you know after what happened to the bureau of statistics uh, can be used to very clearly uh, articulate policies now so we have to look at some of these figures some of these issues uh, immediately after the election and and basically have an audit of where we are in terms of our poverty uh, situation and and how we can help our people uh directly uh you know to to ensure that uh, those who are the most vulnerable uh, in the community 
who are suffering uh, can be taken out. Professor Prasad, what is your plan on taxes and duties? You, you've gone there, you've said that mm. uh, for some, some of the goods, the duties are there mm. and the freight charges continue mm. to increase mm. based on no. uh, international prices. But what's your plan on taxes and duties uh, to cushion the blow on people maybe? What do people expect? Well, as I said to you earlier, Vijay, one of the things that we are going to look at is uh, fiscal duty. As I said, you know, CIF, cost insurance and freight, the freight component has gone up by three, uh, almost by three times. And that's causing uh, a huge rise in prices of imported goods, especially food. I mean, government has, has, uh, has uh, reduced VAT to zero on some of the uh, basic items. Uh, but um, there are many other items uh, and some of those items on which VAT has been reduced also has duty. Uh, so we have to uh, look at all those and see where the, the most vulnerable uh, in our communities uh, need help. And, you know, this argument, in fact, one could argue that the government is earning revenue. Uh, you know, if the freight cost goes up by three times, government is actually getting more revenue. Now, wouldn't it be nice to look at those, some of those revenue? I mean, I don't know uh, because uh, FRC has in the past used to provide monthly projections and then the actual revenue. We don't get this, that kind of you know, data anymore. So when we get into government, I want to look at all those data. I want to look at what is happening and where we can reduce duties. We will do that where it's possible to directly uh, cause a reduction in the price or control the price from further rising, we will do that. Some people are asking whether you will maintain tuition fee-free education, pensions for the elderly and all the social welfare assistance being provided by the current government. Mm -hmm. Will you continue with these and what are you expected to change? That's a very good question, Vijay, because that's what I'm hearing when I go out in the public. There is a fear being created by by elements within the Fiji First Party, their supporters, and even some of the candidates, I'm told, are going there and saying, oh, if there is another government, if Biman Prasad comes in or Rambuka comes in, uh, one old man in, in Nakasi, uh, in Salwa, where I was having this small meeting, you know, asked me, he said, son, uh, uh, we are told that if you guys come into government, my social welfare will be gone. I mean, no government no sensible government, and we are not that stupid, you know, Mr. Rambuka is not that stupid that when we come into government, we're going to take away the social welfare benefits of the most vulnerable. In fact, if you look at uh, the, the cost of living, as you said, Vijay, quite, quite rightly, uh, you know, that is not enough. So the, the next government will have to seriously look at uh, increasing those. By how much, you know, I can't say, but we will have to assess, you know, what is, what is happening None of those benefits and every government that comes in, I mean, one government comes in and builds, you know, uh, two bridges. The next government, uh, when they come in, they don't go and dismantle that bridge. They, they probably build a third one or the fourth one. So some of the benefits that the people are getting, including tuition free, I mean, people ask me whether we will take away the free bus fare. No, those are benefits that people are getting that this government has put in place and, and we, we, we think those are good, good uh, policies, good things. No government in its right mind uh, will, will take those away. So this is the fear and I want to say to the people of this country, uh, you know, don't, don't be threatened by this kind of you know, propaganda from our opponents that you know, the, the next government will take away those benefits. We already know, I know that people are struggling to make ends meet and, and it would be foolish to even you know, think that some of these benefits that people are getting will be taken away by any government, you know, least of all us. Professor Prasad, a question here from uh, Tarun Tikaram from Lamy asking you, mm. why did you uh, lie when you told Parliament that you will reveal the name of the person that told him that the elections in 2014 and 2018 were rigged? Uh, I think um, uh, he's a regular letter writer, you know, who's a critic of uh, me. He's got his facts wrong. 
um, I said in Parliament um, that uh, one of the uh, Fiji First members of Parliament, while drunk in a, in, a, in a hotel, said that we will win the election by rigging again. I didn't say that the election was rigged. I made this very clear. So obviously he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's not correct. And uh, he's, he's, um, that's what I said. And that day, uh, you know, I had to leave Parliament. And next day I had to uh, fly to New Zealand to attend uh, the late Justice Jeram Reddy's funeral. So I was not in Parliament. Uh, if I was in Parliament, I probably would have named the person who said uh, that, who, who was uh, saying that, you know, while drunk. So obviously... Uh, uh, Tarun Tikaram has got his facts wrong. Uh, I've said this before. Uh, he's obviously not uh, um, listening to what I've said. And you would have only said that in Parliament? I would have only said that in Parliament. Because of parliamentary privilege? Yes. I mean, you know, that, that's a privilege I have. And, and uh, because I know that uh, the person uh, that I would have named would have denied uh, that he would have said that. Moving on to more questions coming in. These are from students. Uh, what is your plan for scholarships and student loans? Vijay, uh, let me make this very clear that the current TELS uh, loan scheme, it's a loan scheme. The number of scholarships are very small, you know, the toppers. In the, previously, you had a loan scheme, which was administered by the Public Service Commission then. You had you know, different uh, scholarships. You had the multi-ethnic, you had the ETH, okay. All that was consolidated into a TELS a scheme. So a large majority of the, initially there was only 600 scholarships. Now I think they've increased it to over 1,000. So a large majority of the people, uh, students, it doesn't matter where they come from, what income level they come from. All of them are studying on loan. Uh, right now, I think uh, it's almost close to $600 million is being owed uh, by students who have already uh, graduated from the universities, uh, from tertiary institutions and, and other places. So uh, what has happened is the, the, the rich students, rich family students, the poor students, for, for example, if you have a student coming from, say, Bua, going to Bua College, gets a 290 marks out of 400. That's a damn good mark for, for somebody uh, from a, a rural background, from a school where I, uh, the, the, they may not have all the facilities, uh, access to everything. But that person, uh, you know, coming from a poor family, rural background, uh, would probably would not qualify uh, for a scholarship. So we'll have to go and take loan. Uh, now, I think uh, the government realized that a lot of uh, those students, you know, given the nature of the salary and, and employment, can't pay back. So they brought this idea that, okay, you know, you pay 50% and you get a discount. Now they're suggesting that you could go and borrow 50% uh, from the bank and then, you know, pay and you get a discount. But again, that's helping those who are already probably coming from the rich family you know, who, who have rich parents, who have other sources of income, who could pay and then get a discount. Uh, but those from very poor families. So I think the, the TELS uh, loan scheme, uh, you know, I know some parties have said, you know, they're going to convert all the loan scheme into uh, a scholarship. Ideally, uh, in this country, uh, everybody would like to provide free education for everyone right up to the uh, tertiary level. Uh, in the last election, we suggested that we keep the TELS uh, loan scheme, we keep the toppers, but we also increase the number of scholarships based on a means test. Means that based on salary. Yeah, so, so uh, the, the idea of increasing the number of scholarship uh, is, is, uh, is a good one. And that is so something salary that based uh, scholarship uh, criteria, yeah. more scholarships. Yeah. Uh, what about the TELS loans? You continue with that? We, we, we I think the, we, it, it is not possible for me to right now say in terms of uh, how much it will cost uh, to convert all the students who are studying on loan into scholarship. But we always had a loan scheme. 
So uh, I think all the parties who are looking at this will have to seriously look at that. In fact, one of the problems with this, with this government, uh, Vijay and, and for opposition parties, uh, now that we have this draconian law about manifestos, we don't have the data. So if I ask, if I write to TELS, for example, or uh, we don't, we, we are not privy to a lot of the information so that we can analyze, we can say, though this is what it's costing, this is how we can, you know, juggle and, and get a policy stance so that, you know, it's very clear, you know, in terms of financial commitment. But uh, definitely, when we get into government, we need to improve that. We need to ensure that there are more scholarships uh, and the loan scheme uh, stays uh, so that uh, until we make a transition, until we have an economy, until we are in a, in a situation where we can provide free education right up to tertiary uh, education, that would be the ideal. That would be the ultimate goal and the vision. What is your assessment on the health sector and what specific actions you think should be taken? We will be, Vijay, releasing our vision uh, for the health services in this country uh, uh, when we release the vision plan, uh, you know, probably the end of November or first week of uh, December. Uh, but let me say this, I've said this in Parliament, uh, and, and there's nothing new uh, that I'm saying to you. Never in the history of this country, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, you know, around health centres. I, I, I was a student at the university, we used to frequent, you know, CWM and look at other health centres, even Rewanga Health Centre. Never in the history of this country, we've had such bad health services. And, you know, it's a sad sad reflection of the way in which this government has handled the health situation in this country. So the next government, you know, and we in particular, uh, we, I have discussed this with Mr. Rambuka, we've discussed it with the, the other people in the People's Alliance and within the party, and we know that that, is, that has to be one of our priority. In fact, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, it's not just about money. It's not about just throwing money. It's about getting the people to do the work. You know, it doesn't take a lot of imagination uh, and, and effort to fix a door in the hospital, to provide adequate bedding and, and you know, medicine in health centers. It doesn't require that kind of money. Now, I can't, for the life of me, understand why this government and why this current Minister for Health, uh, you know, cannot deal with it. Shortage of medicine. I mean, it's just, it's just not on. I mean, it's, it's a failure of governance. It's a failure of delivery of services uh, in, in the health sector. So just making sure that the system works, that people who are experts, you know, we, we will let people do their work. That's what we will do. And, and I can tell you, Vijay, that in the first 100 days, you know, we are going to sort out some of those niggling, you know, bottlenecks so that, you know, we can put in, a, apart from some of the big things that we uh, want to, uh, uh, you know, suggest to the people and have a vision, we want to have a world-class health system in this country. Uh, we want to set up the foundation in the next four years so that we end up with a world-class health system. And it's not impossible for us to do that. So your vision in relation to that will be released uh, towards the end of this month. Government debt, according to uh, the 2022-2023 national budget, this statement by the Minister for Economy, mm. the government debt was estimated at around $9.1 billion or 89.4% mm. of GDP mm. at the end of July 2022. Mm. The Minister for Economy said in two years the government lost about $2.8 billion in revenue mm. during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. He says the average cost of our overall debt portfolio as of July was 4.4% mm. of almost a quarter from pre-pandemic levels. Mm. What is your assessment on government debt based on statements mm. that we had to borrow due to a huge reduction in government revenue? Uh, that, that's all right for the Minister for Economy to um, uh, talk about you know, debt during COVID. But he, he forgets to tell the people of this country that they have been piling debt you know, since 2006. So from 2006, the debt level was about $2.8 billion. 
uh, it's reached 9 uh, billion uh, in July 2022 as projected, as you said. You take out uh, 2.8 billion, you still uh, left with a debt that they have piled up in 15 years compared to uh, the debt that was piled up in uh, 35, 36 years. So this is a government that uh, went on a spending spree uh, and I said that in Parliament that they were, they were spending, especially when since I've been in Parliament and I've followed the budgets and the expenditure, the Auditor General's reports uh, very, very carefully and I said in Parliament that my estimate between 2015 and 2020 is that the government would have wasted on average taxpayers on average about $500 million a year. So in six years, you could look at about $3 billion being wasted through pilferage, mismanagement, corruption, etc., etc. And, and so it's a wastage uh, that I have seen, uh, which has, in my view, been unprecedented. And, you know, uh, the Minister for Economy uh, can say, oh, these are, uh, you know, uh, estimates, that's fine. Uh, let's maybe, you know, have an inquiry. Uh, let's look at, you know, where we, we, we could have cut down on that wastage. So one of the things that we will do in government is to look at how we, we, can, we can cut wastage. And let me just give you a, a preview of what we might do. It may, may sound small. Uh, we are going to cut the minister's salaries in the first 100 days by 30%, or by one third. And, and, and you know, we, we want to do that, uh, you know, although it may sound a small amount, but it's a symbolic act uh, to show the people of this country, soon after we get into government, that we mean business, we mean, uh, you know, we will not waste taxpayers' funds. And, and so if you look at what has happened uh, after the COVID, before COVID, 2019, the economy was contracting. Uh, we were in a negative growth. Now, soon after COVID, we did, we had run out of money. We'd run out of ideas. We got all our vaccines, you know, uh, donated. We got budget support from Australia and New Zealand. We borrowed more. But one of the more important things that they don't talk about, Vijay, is the amount of remittances from our family and friends. In 2020 and 2021, put together, almost a total of $1.5 billion came in remittances. In fact, that sustained a lot of people. I am told that this year, the first quarter, uh, remittance was more than $300 million. So if you project that to four quarters, you're actually looking at about $1.2 billion, an estimate of $1.2 billion coming into remittances in 2022. And that's sustaining a lot of families. I know there are families. One supermarket, uh, I'm told, uh, was distributing about 1,000, um, distributing grocery to 1,000 people sent through online shopping by families and friends overseas. So, uh, you know... Going back to wastage. So this is, wastage. This, is, this is what I'm saying. This is a government that has not, uh, not cared... To, to cut down on wastage. And, and we are going to do that. We are going to cut the number of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, when I was the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, uh, which uh, when I was removed, you know, through a motion in Parliament, I was actually questioning government policy on leasing government vehicles. And he said, oh, no, you can't question policy. But if the policy is leading to wastage, if it could be, that's something that the Public Accounts Committee, uh, you know, should be able to look at. So I am confident, and I've seen what has happened in Parliament in the last eight years. I know the budget. I know the, the, the different ministries. I know the flashpoints. I know where wastage can be uh, reduced. That is what we will do. And, and we believe that if we cut some of those wastage, we will be able to put that into the priority areas of health, education, social welfare, these are areas that will need poverty alleviation, that would need a lot of attention. And for the economy, that's a good thing. When you invest in those sectors, it's actually good for the economy. It's, it's, it's not, it's not uh, going to, in fact, it'll help the economy.
You're watching Fiji Village Street Talk. I'm VJ Narayan. We'll be back after this break. Bulovinaka, I'm VJ Narayan. As Fiji goes to the polls, we at Fiji Village are committed to bringing you fair, accurate and balanced coverage of the issues that matter. Visit the Fiji Votes 2022 section on Fiji Village for all the latest on the 2022 Fijian general elections. Download the all-new Fiji Village app right now. You're watching Fiji Village Street Talk. I'm VJ Narayan. Our guest tonight, the leader of the National Federation Party, Professor Biman Prasad. Professor Prasad, the economy is expected to bounce back with double-digit growth after COVID. This has been said by IMF, ADB and other financial institutions. What is your assessment? Well, Vijay, I mean, it, it's not um, a, a big deal in the sense that, you know, if the government is trying to say, oh, you know, we're going to achieve a double-digit growth. I mean, people have to understand that we went into a negative growth. So when you, when you are recovering from, from that uh, negative growth, obviously the growth will, will, will be much higher. So, you know, in a, in a sense, you know, we are catching up uh, from, from the lost growth that we experienced during COVID. Um, but let me just, just say uh, this government's economic policy and how it's been totally misplaced. And we said this, uh, I've been saying it in the last uh, you know, eight years. I said, you know, let's not just remain focused on tourism, on Fiji Airways. And when the COVID pandemic hit us, imagine if we had uh, been producing 3 million tons of sugar cane. Uh, you know, we, people would not have been in that dire situation. The, the sugar industry uh, has a huge multiplier effect. You know, every dollar that comes into the country stays here. Whereas, you know, the, every dollar that comes from tourism, a good percentage of it leaks out of the, of the economy. And there was a lot of talk about re-looking at agriculture sector, sugar and non-sugar crop sector. In fact, from non-sugar, we are only exporting, uh, you know, about 100 million worth of produce uh, compared to $700 million of fuel bill, you know, import uh, bill on fuel. So, um, you know, we, we will, when we come into government, we are going to, uh, we are going to look at how we can diversify the economy, how we can improve the productive productive sectors uh, such as agriculture, you know, forestry, fisheries. Uh, government um, basically, uh, you know, treated these, these productive sectors like a, like, a, uh, like a side issue. And overwhelmingly, therefore, and they're, they're going back to that. They're, they're projecting, you know, they're, they're boasting about, you know, all this recovery based on, you know, how the tourism numbers of course, uh, tourism numbers will, will bounce back. But whether the economy can be sustained just on tourism uh, was shown very, very uh, clearly you know, during COVID. So um, we are going to reset some of the, the economic policies and, and make sure that we have an inclusive uh, economy, inclusive growth strategy, uh, so that uh, you know, different sectors of the economy 
uh, support each other. Questions have come in about civil servants' pay. They said that you have said about you'll cut the minister's pay. Uh, what about civil servants' pay, contracts, retirement age and conditions? Yeah. Uh, Vijay, uh, I, I know a, there was a lie being uh, perpetrated uh, when, uh, when I said about the uh, reduction in pay uh, for the uh, Prime Minister, ministers and members of Parliament and those right up to the director level. And then, you know, it was, it was, um, uh, it was alleged that I had said a civil sal uh, salary cut for the civil servants. And in fact, that lie is still being, I saw some briefing notes for Fiji Fest candidates. You know, somebody sent me the briefing notes that they got and, and it's written there, civil service salary cut, Biman. I never advocated a, a civil salary cut in the way that the Fiji Fest uh, candidates are going around. In fact, uh, one media organization, you know, apologized, you know, after uh, I, I, I took them to court uh, on, on that issue. And, and you know, Vijay, you covered the story where it was very clearly stated what I, what I said. So uh, that, that kind of lie is, is being spread. And I want to assure the civil servants that that's not uh, uh, the party's position and that would not be our position. So you're not cutting the... civil servants' pay? Uh, no, we've never said that. A retirement age? Uh, retirement age was a policy that we uh, clearly articulated in 2018. Uh, we believe that it's an ill-conceived uh, policy of, of uh, 55. Uh, the retirement age should be restored back to 60. And what about contracts? The... Uh, yes, three, four, five year contracts. We, we have made that position very, very clear. We want to go back to permanent employment uh, for those in the civil service, you know, statutory organizations, teachers, you know, this, this casual employment, uh, you know, they talk about five year, three year married appointment, but a lot of civil servants are under pressure, under siege. They don't know. Some of them are on, on sh short term contracts. And, and so these are issues that uh, we have to uh, deal with and change to ensure that we provide you know, permanency of employment, at least for our civil servants and, and teachers, because that's when you can have an independent, independent, uh, neutral civil service for a government uh, to politicize the civil service. And, and civil servants are afraid. Civil teachers are being forced to campaign. Teachers are being forced to organize meetings for Fiji Fest candidates at their home. And I know that. I know that. We have information on that. And, and this is only happening because people are fearful. People are on short-term contracts. Uh, they are not sure whether, you know, if, if somebody, if the minister uh, is, is upset or the permanent secretary is upset, they could lose their jobs. Because in the constitution, the hiring and firing of civil servants is by the permanent secretary with the agreement of the minister. It's, it's in the constitution. So the minister has a final say on who is appointed at what uh, salary and, and, and for how long. Now, we want to remove all those ambiguities. We want to remove all those doubts. We want to go back to per permanency of employment in the civil service so that the civil service remains a neutral arm. Governments can come and go, but the civil servants must remain neutral. Civil servants must remain independent. At the moment, they can't do that. They can't go and tell the minister, look, uh, say, this is not what you can do. This is wrong. This is not in the budget. The, the permanent secretaries uh, can't do that. The civil servants can't do that. In the past, Civil servants, permanent secretaries could go and tell the minister, sorry, say, this is not what you can do because this is against the guy. That's how civil service must operate. That's how civil servants operate in any country. Questions coming in from some USP students about uh, Fijian government grants totaling about $80 million not mm -hmm. being given. Mm -hmm. uh, what will your government do if you do come into power? Uh, Vijay, first of all, it's, it's a very sad state of affairs. This is a government which is hell-bent on destroying one of the most successful regional institutions and universities uh, in the region. And, and they are only doing it because they didn't like the vice chancellor, because somebody went and said that this man may not be supporting the government. 
you know, they deported him, uh, you know, in a Gestapo-style operation uh, in, in, in the middle of the night. And four independent investigations. Some of the investigations were instigated by their own people, by, the, by, by Fiji government reps on the council. And all those investigations cleared the vice chancellor. Yet, Ayah Sayyid Qiyum keeps on insisting, even now, oh, we want an independent inquiry. Independent inquiry by this government, you know, to their satisfaction. And just because, you know, they, just because of that, they are holding thousands of students, parents, and the region to ransom by holding the grants. No government in the history of this country behaved like this towards USP. They respected the governance structure. The council is made up of ministers, you know, even prime ministers, presidents of the Pacific Island countries. They have made the decision that after all those four inquiries, investigations, the vice chancellor was, was cleared. And this is this government is holding them to ransom. And, and not, they've lost the votes in the council many times. And they still insist that, oh, no, we must have an independent inquiry. Now, when we come into government, we've said this very clearly. And, and, and basically, you know, I want to assure all the students, uh, parents, and the people of this country, and indeed, you know, uh, we, we should be apologizing to the region uh, for the stance that our government, you know, that Fiji has taken. Uh, so uh, the grants that they owe to the university is, is dead. In fact, you know, we should add that 88 million or whatever to our, our debt level. It, it, it's, it's a money that the that Fiji government owes to the region, to the university, to the council. And, and any government, uh, like any other debt, would have an obligation to pay that. There's a question from Muni Lakshmi uh, from Lotoka asking you, what will you do for MBBS student studies? She has a daughter in second year of studies, but she was not given a scholarship. What will the NFP government do if they come to government? Well, Vijay, that, that's another uh, sad state of affairs. Uh, I know, I know, I, I raised that issue about MBBS. Uh, they said, oh, you know, we have enough doctors, so we're not giving scholarships. Uh, then they said, okay, we're going to give, uh, you know, uh, $10,000 each for those who... Then they said those who are coming from foundation studies uh, will not get an MBBS. So it, 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 they made a whole... They made a hodgepodge of, of their own... Uh, policy on on what should happen. I mean, it shows uh, this government's lack of uh, planning. I mean, uh, that's one issue. The other one, you know, in terms of skills. I mean, when they were setting up these technical colleges, I want them in parliament. I want the then minister for education, Mahendra Reddy, that you know, why are you doing this? That there are technical vocational uh, facilities in the schools. Upgrade that. Improve that. They didn't do that. They went and spent millions of dollars setting up technical colleges. All of them collapsed. Then they said FNU should take it over. Then FNU, when, uh, when they took it over, there was not enough money. Now, all that facilities, all this investment is gone. And in fact, the, the shortage of technical skills in this country is not only as a result of migration and better pay in Australia and New Zealand, it's the ill-conceived policies of this government. And that is another area, Vijay, that we will have to immediately look at and invest in how we can improve technical education uh, so that we can train you know, enough mechanics, enough plumbers, you know, enough uh, uh, you know, uh, joiners. Uh, these are skills that, that uh, are badly needed in this country and we are facing a lot of shortage. Another question here, what are your plans for personal income taxes? Will you increase personal income tax for those who are above the 30,000 threshold? Of course, right now, people who earn 30,000 or less do not pay any personal income tax. What is uh, the NFP stand on it? Vijay, uh, we, uh, we, we, we are going to look at, as I said to you, uh, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to project what is the state of government finances now? Uh, because as I said, you know, I don't trust much of the forecast and what of, uh, much of what is coming from, from government sources. 
So when we get into government, we are going to look at, in fact, when they raised the uh, threshold from 16,000 to uh, 30,000, uh, everyone, this is before the 2018 ele election, uh, you know, a lot of people, be those between 16 and 30, they probably, they, they deserved it. They, not to pay any taxes because the cost of living was rising. So it probably was a good policy. But people earning even 100,000, also benefited from that. Uh, you know, so before, if you're earning 100,000, you're paying a tax on 84,000. But when the threshold went up from 16 to 30,000, you're actually paying a uh, tax on 70,000. So everybody benefited from the raise in the threshold from 16 to 30,000. Uh, and and it, it, was, it was kind of, uh, you know, not not targeted uh, to those who needed the most. So those are some of the issues uh, that we will have to look at uh, when we look at all the data, we look at all the revenue forecast and where are other sources of revenue if we change. And we are not going to change tax policies willy-nilly. Uh, this is another thing I want to say. We are going to work with the stakeholders. I have already said that we probably have two you know, for the first two years, we probably have two uh, economic summits. We want to work with the business. We want to work with the people to design policies. We're not going to be dictated by one or two uh, people around, uh, you know, the, uh, a particular government minister and come up with, you know, a tax policy or a, or a, or a law which uh, doesn't benefit the large majority of the people. So those are a style of governance that we want to change uh, so that we can make the right policies. Some of the decisions are yet to be made. Some of the decisions are yet to be made. So the personal income, income tax issue will be based on actual data yeah. and then you will let people know. We will, we, we will not just <coughs> look at piecemeal uh, you know, uh, changes. We are going to look at the whole tax system. And, and see where uh, we can make it more efficient, where we can make it more administratively simple. Because the tax system in this country has become too complex. You know, for example, we have three rates of weight. We have zero, we have nine, we have 15. Uh, you know, there are a lot of distortions. Uh, and I know from, as an economist, if you, if you have a tax system which is very complex, which is difficult for business. Businesses are finding it very, very difficult. The accountants in businesses are, are not working for the businesses. They're spending hours and hours dealing with the FRCS because the system has just become too complex and people don't know. So we want to make it simple. We want to make it logical. We want to make sure that it's, it, government gets enough revenue and the people are not spending money on transaction uh, transactional uh, costs because you know the the whole tax system is in, is hodgepodge how many seats are you targeting to get in this election do you believe you have the lineup of candidates to deliver well uh, vijay one of the things uh, that is difficult as you know uh, after this government changed the law on on polling we used to have at least one media organization uh, whether we liked it or not there was some sort of poll uh, to judge, you know, the party's support. Now, that's not being done, but our own uh, assessment on the ground uh, and other people who are assessing, uh, some people are suggesting that, you know, we could be um, uh, hitting between 8 to 12, some are saying between 10 to 15. One thing I can say, you know, I don't want to put a number, but one thing I'm very, very confident uh, and very optimistic that we will win substantially more seats uh, in this election and we will be in a very very strong position uh, when we form the government with our partners the people's alliance if it comes to negotiations who will you be ready to work with well uh, i know um, uh, uh, fiji first obviously is out of the question uh, because i think the people of this country don't want them in government that's our assessment right now so uh, it doesn't make sense for us to say that. Uh, I, I think that um, we will be able to form the government uh, between the two of us. 
Uh, I know there are other parties who have said that they are open to um, working with us. You know, that's welcome. Uh, one uh, party has, in the opposition has said that they are open to um, uh, any, any party, including the Fiji First. I mean, that's their choice. Uh, our choice is not the Fiji First party. I can tell you that. My final question is about the arrangement if the NFP wins majority number of seats mm -hmm. and People's Alliance... What happens then? We'll cross the bridge when we come to it. <laughs> but you're looking at, uh, you sort of said that substantially you'll win uh, from the current three yeah. to eight to 10, 12 or 15. Yeah. Uh, with an understanding, most likely you're already seeing the picture, yeah. people's, uh, people's Alliance winning more than more than you, more seats what, than you. What we, what we have said, Vijay, I mean, I usually... Uh, don't like to answer hypothetical questions, but let me just say this, that the, the partnership is very clear. We have decided, uh, this, is, this is the agreement that we signed, we have decided that we will form the government uh, regardless of the number uh, that the People's Alliance uh, has in terms of seats or us. The two parties have decided that between the two of us, we will form the government. And, and that's the bottom line. And there are a number of principles that we have also signed, uh, which will form the basis of uh, forming the next government. But, uh, you know, come the election and the results, uh, if um, there is a, a need to um, uh, invite other parties who may make the threshold, um, then that's something that we will uh, decide when we come to it. And you've stated it already that, according to your understanding, uh, Mr. Rambuka will be the Prime Minister. Yes, yes. Thank you, Professor Prasad. Uh, that was Professor Biman Prasad on our show tonight. Thank you very much. And uh, he's currently uh, getting confirmations, but he has also confirmed for our leaders' debate, that is on Sunday, 11th December, and that will be at 7 p.m. Uh, leaders that have confirmed so far, uh, Mr. Ngavoka uh, from Sodelpa, uh, Mr. Narumbe from uh, Unity Fiji, Professor Biman Prasad also confirming tonight. Uh, tomorrow night we have uh, the leader of People's Alliance, uh, Mr. Sitiveni Rambuka at 7 p.m. And uh, we have uh, extended our invitation to... Uh, Fiji first leader, uh, Vorenge Badimarama, and the general secretary, Aya said Kayum, uh, we have left slots open for them next week uh, for their appearance to talk to you directly about their policies and their stand. On Wednesday, 30th November, uh, we are looking at a debate on the economy and the issues surrounding that. Uh, for that, we have invited uh, Aya said Kayum, uh, uh, Professor Biman Prasad, Savilara Narumbe, uh, Manua Kamikamida, Mr. Chaudhary, and uh, a Sodelpa person who is yet to confirm. On uh, Tuesday, 6 December, we have uh, a panel discussion with the women candidates from different parties. And on uh, Thursday, 8 December, a uh, discussion with the younger candidates, candidates, the youth candidates. So all of these plans are rolling out. But we'll join you again tomorrow night as we speak to Mr. Rambuka. Have a good evening. I haven't confirmed on the economy one yet. <laughs>